Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, just about. Um, my name is Alex Fraser. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the School, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the lunchtime session on leadership, part of our 2013 Alumni World Forum. The inaugural uh, World Forum took place in 2010 and was a, a unique opportunity to celebrate our global alumni network. We've got over 36,000 alumni in the UK and overseas. And some of them will be following the panel discussions live, um, as well as interacting with Cliff, I think it is, who's handling our Twitter feed. Uh, around 30 or so satellite events happening around the world, uh, hosting, hosted by our alumni volunteers. And I think these occasions are serve more than any other to illustrate the power and the, the depth of our global network. Since the last uh, World Alumni Forum, a lot has happened at CAS. We've received a significant amount of investment from City University uh, for both uh, staff and for bricks and mortar. We've added a large number of new faculty to our outstanding team of academics, some of whom are sitting before you today. Uh, we've broadened and deepened our footprint, particularly in the topical areas of uh, CSR and entrepreneurship. And we're also strengthening our executive education business. We've just signed a new lease on a building near St Paul's, which will be our executive hub, and which will open in September of this year, which is very exciting. And we're currently redeveloping our undergraduate business school in Northampton Square, to give it much more of a Bun Hill Row look and feel. And that, again, will be ready for September of this year. Since 2010, uh, I think there's been a huge change in our, in the sort of uh, community that sits around CAS. In 2010, there were something like 25 small businesses in what is called Tech City. There are now over 3,000 dynamic small businesses within a mile north and east of us today and we aim to be as relevant to that community as we are to our existing networks uh, in the city and elsewhere. So thank you for coming uh, and for being with us to celebrate our global community. I have no doubt the panel session will provide stimulating uh, insights into the topic of leadership and I'm very grateful to our panellists. And finally, it will probably come as no surprise that we have not planned a fire alarm test for today. Um, so if alarm does go, it would be for real, and please make your way to the exits at the back. So thank you, and it's now my pleasure to hand over to Cliff Oswick, who's got an incredibly long job title, so I'll let him do it himself. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go through my whole title, otherwise it'll occupy far too much time. But I'm Deputy Dean here at Cass Business School, and I'm Professor of Organisation Theory is my particular area, so I have a, a direct interest in leadership. Um, today's session, we've got a panel that blends both uh, individuals from, from the kind of real world, as it were, and individuals from the academic community, and we're trying to get a, a perspective and a balance around issues of practice and theory and the whole engagement with leadership. It's quite funny, I, I, I came back to the UK yesterday morning and I was involved in the leadership panel last night, head to head, uh, with the, uh, another colleague over in uh, Shoreditch at one of these uh, media companies and there was, the debate there was, his position was leadership, what a fantastic thing and my position was leadership, what a bad thing. And particularly I was focusing on the idea of non-leadership and that, it, that leaders should not lead on occasions and one of the strengths of leading is knowing when not to lead. Uh, and I think one of the other things that emerged from that is the extent to which leadership is pervasive um, and it's also very loosely defined. So we have leadership in the sense of the micromanagement of a small group of individuals and we have leadership in terms of things like um, the Nelson Mandela variety of leadership where people lead a complete country. Um, and the two are very different. Remote leadership requires a different set of skills and attributes. Direct one-to-one -one leadership requires very different abilities. So Nelson Mandela may be fantastically good at managing a country, but he may actually not be very good at one-to-one -one management. I can imagine a situation, a scenario, where two people walk in and say, both of us want next Friday off. What are we going to do about it, Nelson? 
and that might not be the thing that is best equipped to deal with. So in that regard, I think we need to separate what I'd refer to as far leadership uh, and near leadership. And I'm sure the panellists will kind of engage in both those perspectives, but I think we need to separate those things out a little bit. Um, and I'm sure there'll be questions around that, but if we keep those things separate, then we have a better kind of uh, way of, in, of engaging in, the, in a way that allows us to understand that they are very different phenomena. Let me just introduce the panel. The structure for today is that each panelist is going to have a five-minute opening statement with regard to their position on leadership. Then we're going to open it out to the audience here and the audience around the world. We have a live stream, and I'm going to try to see if I can manage to use this iPad effectively to take questions from around the world as we, as we go. OK, let me introduce the panelists. They're going to speak in the order in which they're sitting. Um, and immediately uh, to, my, to my right, to your left, is Greg Clark. Greg Clark is the uh, chairman of the Football League. He's held various senior positions in industry over the years. Um, and in many ways, most importantly, he's an alumni of CAS, alumnus. He did his MBA in, you don't mind me saying, Greg, do you? No, no. 1983, don't so my 30, 30 years ago he, he uh, graduated from CAS. And then immediately to his right we have Amanda Goodhall, who's recently joined us from, uh, from, well, from Warwick and from Zurich, and has had various roles at institutions. Um, and has various, it might be embarrassing you, but has had various jobs, uh, was a, a fashion model for a period of time, and an activist and a campaigner for a period of time. Um, and we're very lucky that she's joined us recently and she's going to talk about particularly expert leadership is one of the areas she's been studying. And then we have uh, Rob, Robert Phillips, who's the former CEO of uh, Endelman's, which is the world's, the, is it the world's largest PR company? Because people always, as I said that before, people have debated that with me. The world's largest PR company. Uh, Robert's really recently stood down from that role uh, because he wanted time out to work on a book in particular and to get involved in in other projects and issues. Uh, and his work particularly focuses on things around uh, citizenship, around issues around the nature of the PR industry, and rethinking issues of leadership amongst other things. Okay. And finally, Professor Joe Sylvester, who's joined CAS from the uh, <coughs> Department of Psychology here at City University, uh, who has an expertise in leadership, particularly around political leadership, and has worked with uh, the, the liberal the Liberals, isn't it? Amongst the others? The Conservatives, well, there you go. <laughs> same, uh, same, well, um, yeah, more or less the same thing. Okay. Um, um, no offence to anyone who <laughs> attended. You can never, never, never erase real life, can you? Okay, so we're going to start with five minutes from each uh, of our panellists, and we'll try to keep it to five minutes and open it up to the audience. Thank you. Greg. Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I graduated from here in 1983, uh, and I've been through a business studies degree. I was a FTSE 100 uh, graduate trainee, and I came here to do the executive MBA for two years. And I left with a useful set of skills, which grew me uh, in a variety of roles, which led me to run a FTSE 20 company, an ASX 50 company, the Football League now. I'm chairman of some private equity businesses, a PLC, and also the Met Office, because I'm interested in climate change and global warming. What I'd like to do is to challenge you all, because uh, events in life are what you have to deal with. What you plan for is easy. What surprises you is hard. And I've learnt a lot about myself and my leadership style and the failings of my leadership style in various crises. Let me give you a few examples. What do you do, as it happened to me, when you're sitting in the office of a serving head of state of one of the biggest countries in the world, and he asks you for a bribe. You're a long way from home, it's a dangerous place. If you say, what, no, are you going to get home in one piece or are you going to get killed in a road accident on the way back to the airport? What do you do when the corporation you run does the morally right thing and ends up on the end of a class action suit for more than 10 times its market capitalization? As happened to me 10 years ago. We sent our uh, teams down. I had a 300,000 person uh, construction company as part of a global uh, multinational I ran who were asked for help when 9-11 happened. So we sent earth moving equipment, as many people as we could hoover up on the East Coast. 
of uh, the USA down there to help pull people out of the rubble and help support the emergency services. And we ended up being sued for putting people into a hostile environment, you know, environmentally. And we got off in the end, but it nearly brought down the whole corporation. What do you do the first time one of the people working for you in a large corporation gets killed? And you're absolutely mortified because one of you guys gets killed. And then you find out the corporation you've just joined, on average, kills 15 people a year of its 500,000 person workforce. Where does that lead you from a moral leadership position? I think it's very, very, very important that you understand who you are. Because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And ethical people find themselves in situations where they creep towards the edge and gently slide over it with, it, with no volition. And it's really important as leaders to understand what our values are. How many thousands of people will we fire in order to deliver upper quartile total shareholder returns and catalyze tens of millions of share options? How many people will we kill to open up large civil engineering projects in third world countries with inadequate safety standards. When we're asked to support the civil authorities in emergency situations, do we think about the legal consequences before we send our people to do all they can to help? It's really important as potential leaders, you don't get sucked into the theory of leadership. You have to know who you are, what you stand for, and what the red line is you will not cross. Because when it happens, you won't have time to think it through. You have to hone your instincts. And as leaders, if you have poor instincts, you are a poor leader. Thank you. OK, great. <laughs> we will have chance. If you've got questions, then note them down, and we will have chance for questions from all the panellists at the end. My perspective is uh, slightly further away. There's, there's thousands of books uh, on leadership, and most of those books do tend to be personal or anecdotal accounts, and they are very useful. Leaders are important, they're very necessary, they have a lot of power to change things, and, and increasingly they're expensive to hire and fire. But identifying exactly how they affect organisations is challenging, especially when some come and go within a small number of years. If we could, we would ideally randomly assign leaders to organisations and then see their effects, a bit like how treatments are assigned in medical trials. But of course, as social scientists, we can't do that. So I try to step back and to identify some patterns in relatively large data sets, patterns that we might be able to use to generalise in helping us pick the right leaders. The question that I ask is, how much core business knowledge should our leaders have? Over the last couple of decades, we've seen a shift towards hiring the generalist manager. My research su suggests that successful leaders are those who have a deep understanding of the core business of their organisations. I suggest that being a general manager alone is not sufficient. So I found in my research that the best universities in the world, and the, to improve the performance of those universities, you want to put an outstanding scholar in charge. The best hospitals in the United States are more likely to be led by doctors than professional managers. Formula One racing teams win more when they are led by former drivers in comparison to either managers, engineers or mechanics. And basketball teams win more in the NBA if they are led by outstanding former players. And also, interestingly and of relevance to the panel here, most <coughs> football teams are managed by former professional players. And in fact, um, that's overwhelmingly so. Arsene Wenger and the, and, the, and the lovely Jose Mourinho are in fact minority. Many people forget that Alex Ferguson was actually a very good footballer. He, he appeared 317 times in the Scottish League as a professional player, and he scored 170 goals. This is a goal every other game, which is pretty, pretty good. So it goes without saying that leaders have to be experts in management and leadership also. Having expert knowledge is not a proxy for being a good leader and a good manager. So why might um, experts make better leaders? Well, from the qualitative part of my research, 
Um, there were suggestions that they may appear more credible, and particularly to the core workers, because they've walked the walk. They make more in, may make more informed strategic choices. They may also have the long view. And they may make better hiring decisions. If you're an expert in the core business, and if we all agree that hiring people is the most important thing, which is why, of course, MBAs and, and these courses are important, if you're an expert in the core business, you may make a better choice about hiring the right people. And finally, you may send a signal to the market and to other possible hires that you actually know what you are talking about in this industry. Thank you. As, uh, <clears throat> as Cliff introduced me, I, I've spent 27 years in the world of public relations and public affairs advising large corporations and businesses, and that is what brought me uh, to CAS, really, to explore this notion of citizen-centric leadership. And citizen-centric leadership, I think, offers the logical solution in an age of citizen-centric power. Because this, this, this mega-trend of individual empowerment is, is not going to go away. And we continue to see the power shift from states to citizen, from employer to employee, from corporation to consumer. And technology costs us communication, obviously accelerates globalization, and it accelerates democracy. And what we see as a result is atomization, activism, and the asymmetry of power. And I think that citizen-centric leadership is best equipped to, to address these issues head on. And some of the traditional theories, I just don't think are enough any longer. And I agree with Greg that you can't live by theory. But those theories are not enough to deal with the chaotic, complex, and fragile world in which we find ourselves, where trust continues to evaporate, where management is mistaken for leadership, and where the fundamentals of capitalism are, are quite rightly, I think, being challenged. I think citizen-centric leadership needs to be co-created with real people within organisations. It legitimises authority in this way, I think, through a more intimate connection. So you asked the question about far or near. I think the answer is near, an intimate connection between the leaders and the aspirations and the needs of those that they lead. I think it's co-created because it flows from the consensus of the networks of real people and their communities. In that sense, it is horizontal, but it's not anarchic. And so therefore we see citizen leaders empowering and facilitating and, and eventually helping channel the activism of others. And I think it ultimately will realign the purpose of business with the needs of societies. Um, I've done a lot of work and hopefully researching here at, at CAS, the tests as I would see them of, of trusted leadership. And I think trusted leaders are visionary. I think they're fully transparent and accountable. I think they empower and democratise their organisations by participating, not dictating. That I believe that they believe in transformation and have transition plans, but ultimately they prove who they are through what they do, not through what they say. I also think that this classical, this, sorry, the citizen-centric leadership is actually rooted in classical political thought. So in many ways, the answers of tomorrow are actually rooted uh, in the past. And I think that citizen-centric leadership remakes the case or re-establishes the case for the state as an active policy for the common good of all its citizens, and whether that's a business state or whether it's a nation state. But it's not about, leadership is not about the pursuit or the protection of power. And I think to quote or to paraphrase Aristotle, it's about the restoration of virtuous leadership. Importantly, citizen-centric leadership, I think, will safeguard us against the madness and deception of markets and of the libertarians because I think that citizen-centric leadership would challenge the market fundamentalists of the past 35 years, which, to, to paraphrase Sandel, has emptied uh, public life of moral argument and it views effectively the polis with contempt. I think that citizen-centric leadership actually reaffirms that there is such a thing as society and there is such a thing as public interest. And, of course, the failures of, of leadership and the failures of the social democratic model of leadership have effectively allowed those market fundamentalists to fill uh, an intellectual vacuum. And the danger is that in this age of digital technology where everything is accelerating, citizen democracy, if unchecked, actually plays neatly to the libertarians. And therefore, what I think we need to do, as well as rethinking leadership, is to, to reimagine the state. And leadership of the state, and this may come on to what Joe is going to talk about, needs to shift towards um, citizen empowerment and away from, from old hierarchies of command and control. So 
what does this sort of citizen-centric leadership look like in business? I think it means co-creating ideas, co-creating strategies, co-creating programs with networks of regular people and shaping organisations, products and services around their needs and aspiration and actually helping better define both common purpose and shared value. And we know that firms that have higher levels of engagement have better staff retention, have uh, deeper uh, relationships with their customers and in fact have exponential revenue growth. So I think that citizen-centric leadership recognises activism and respects its citizen employees and citizen consumers both as trusted advisors, as authentic advocates and as agents for change. So therefore, what do, do business leaders need to do? Well, I think they need to embrace the citizen state within. I think they have to accept the fragility and fragmentation of the world. I think they have to build coalitions, both within their organisations and with their employees. I think they have to embrace technology and they have to see digitisation as an extension of the democracy of an organisation, not a threat to it. I think they have to radicalise honesty and I think they have to fundamentally address the 99% and make sure that we can protect public interest over selfish ambition. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to take us in a slightly different direction. I'm going to make um, a contentious claim, some might argue. I'm going to say that um, politicians are important and they deserve our attention and they deserve our support. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my involvement with politicians and political leadership and how that's actually challenged my own understanding of leadership and what we might learn from that to um, perhaps apply it in business settings as well. Um, I, I need to go back more than 10 years now, back to, to 2000. Um, now, I'm an organisational psychologist, which means that I've spent a lot of time looking at how you shape and uh, develop selection processes for organisations, how you identify leaders and nurture leadership talent. Um, and I've also been involved in, in a lot of work research on diversity, and some of that research was picked up by the newspapers back in 2000. Um, and I got this letter. I got this letter from Conservative Central, um, Central Headquarters from the Candidates Department. Now, now I'm somebody who had, had no involvement in politics whatsoever up until that point in time. And I got this letter, and it was very interesting, and it was from Christina Dykes, who was the Director of Candidates and Development at that time. And she wrote to me, and she said, I've read about your research about diversity and identifying future leaders. Um, We'd be very interested to talk to you, although we'd understand if you didn't want to talk to us, because I'm not, I'm not sure if you remember, but at that time, the, the, the Conservative Party was just about to lose its second general election, and William Hague was the leader, and then it became Ian Duncan Smith. Um, and I thought, gosh, this is interesting. I've done nothing with politics, nothing with politicians. I'll go and talk to her. Um, and I remember sitting, having this discussion, and, and finding out a little bit about what the Conservative Party did to identify and um, approve prospective parliamentary candidates. Um, and I remember asking her, well, you've got this process. It was based on the old Sandhurst model. And I said, well, what are you looking for? What are you looking for in your future, you know, future political leaders? And I remember she looked at me. and. This is not typical of the Conservative Party, by the way. At that point, it made me realise that people really hadn't got a shared understanding about what good political leadership is. Um, and therefore, there was no real shared idea about the sorts of qualities and characteristics that you might be looking for or what a good political leadership, a leader was. And, um, and having gone after that and looked at the literature and the political science literature, political psychology, I realised that there'd been no work really whatsoever trying to identify what good political leadership was and the characteristics of politicians. Now, as a psychologist, I'm focused on the individuals. Political scientists tended to focus more on the organisations, political psychologists more on mass voting. Um, but I see politicians as political workers. And really, to, to cut a very long story short, I went through a process of redeveloping the um, the party's approval process for prospective parliamentary candidates. And that really involved um, more of a democratic process of trying to capture shared understandings of what good political performance and good political leaders were within the party. 
And for the past decade, I've been working um, at a cross-party level in local government. I've also gone through the same process with the Liberal Democrats, really capturing information, capturing an understanding about what politicians themselves think is good political leadership. And I suppose that the learning that I've got from that is that um, I have a lot more respect for politicians and the roles that they undertake now. Um, I think they're incredibly complex roles. Um, but Robert Louis Stevenson, almost a century ago, said um, politics is perhaps the only profession for which no preparation is deemed necessary. Um, which is interesting and fascinating, and it's another, another big area. But you know, if you think about it, MPs going into Parliament have, I think it's been extended from one to two days induction now. They don't get anything else. So you know, the whole idea about how we identify future leaders, how we support them, and how we understand what their role is, I think is very important. So I'm going to throw that out to you and say that the two key questions that we should be looking at are what is good political leadership, um, what makes a good political leader? And really, I suppose, the third one is how can we build public understanding of political roles? OK, I think you will agree that it's a rich set of perspectives there, deliberately so that we have panellists that take very different positions on the phenomena. Um, let's open it up for questions, both in the audience here and online. Question at the very back, first hand up. for me what you're talking about is individual cases and what I'm trying to get away from in my work is to move us away from this obsession with the individual leader I think that I think the idea of the charismatic leader has gotten us into a lot of trouble so what where I, I will use examples obviously because it, it's interesting but really what I'm trying to do is get us to think back look at data what kind of characteristics these are all just human beings actually what can we understand about them so when it gets into the you know nitty-gritty details of whether Ferguson who played for Scotland and played for you know I mean I would argue that he was one of the better players if you compare to most people in the population but in a sense my point is let's get away from the individual stuff let's try and find some real patterns so that we can start looking back on a, a bit a bit like what Joe is doing and think about bigger data sets, real characteristics, and that's where I'm coming from. So I'm not going to fight you on the football, although afterwards at lunch, let's have a go. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. Yeah. Right, well, next one there, and then we'll come down here. Um, the UK economy, European economy, it remains in a very dire state and has done for five years. I think it's been a complete failure of leadership and a lack of ethics in terms of how they've let things happen, and I'm particularly thinking, not surprisingly, about the banking sector. But taking the leadership theory that you've been discussing earlier, what needs to change to get companies and businesses more forward thinking and getting uh, you know, out of this rut that we're in? Okay. Uh, it goes partly back to, and I'm sure Joe has a point, it goes partly back to what I was saying before. I, I think that the 35 years since sort of the model was broken by Thatcher and Reagan and that this market fundamentalism set in has sort of drained us of a real debate about what public interest and common good looks like. And as a result of that, leadership has been about the drive for power and the maintenance of power, 
not for collective benefit. Um, and part of the problem is that the social democratic tradition sort of lost the argument and can't find a way of rearticulating it. So it's created this sort of intellectual vacuum, in which case people are, are pouring, I think, poor leadership led by the markets, not by the reinterpretation of the polis, the common good of the, of the citizen state. I think, there needs to, well, I think there needs to be a much more explicit conversation, public, a publicly aired conversation about what sort of society do we, do we want. And I think the part of the problem is that where we have leaders who are remote from what's really going on, they don't want to have that, that conversation and they don't understand the right questions to ask. You said um, Greg made the point about, uh, about instincts. And, and in my experience of counselling a lot of business leaders, and political leaders, actually they, they, their instinct exists within a bubble. It doesn't exist within the real world. So politicians make decisions based on what they think the real world is, but it's really the Westminster Village. CEOs make, <laughs> CEOs make decisions based on what they think the real world is, but it's in fact the sort of the golf club of usually male CEOs. And they're not exposed to what the real agenda is, and that's why I'm trying to argue for a greater intimacy between citizen employees, citizen consumers, and, and, and leaders. Okay, great. Do you want to add anything, Jo? Or? Um, well, I think I'd probably make a lot of money if I knew how to answer that question, but I, I, mean, I would reiterate the point being made, really, that um, for me it's about engaging with a broader audience, and I think one of the one of the positive aspects is that um, this whole crisis, um, be it in business, be it in politics, is putting much more scrutiny onto the leaders um, and forcing them to engage. Um, and, and I suppose having spent quite a lot of time working with politicians, uh, you know, it does strike me that we sometimes um, underestimate the extent to which they have the skills to engage in that broader audience. And maybe what we should be doing is looking at what they do and how they learn to engage so that you know, we, we incorporate that more into some of our business processes and business development of future leaders. Okay. Can I make a quick comment? Yeah. Just um, thinking about types of organisations, um, the government has been looking a lot at mutuals again and handing over public service um, provision to mutuals. And some of the early studies um, that are showing that actually the performance is very, very good. The leaders that are, that are being picked um, apparently also know the, their area very, very well. And also well-being at work has been, very, has been uh, has shown to be very, very high. And in a sense, that's about going, uh, I think, takes up your point really is the idea of people well, being experts in, in the core business if you like but actually individuals having a bit more say over the, the outcomes of the organisations and I would say that is a very interesting route that, that if government carries going down there I think it will show some very interesting results. So okay. for just to add on that you, you saw that the, for those of you that are involved in, in following the UK press you saw the, the stuff that's been going on about David Cameron's appointment to Joe Johnson to his policy unit and, and the press get it wrong because they asked the question um, you know, oh, it's just an old boys' club. It's another old Etonian, and that's sort of the easy soundbite. But the, the the question is whether that Joe Johnson has the right level of engagement with the broader community in order to answer some of the questions, not what school he went to. And and he's not a woman, as a, as I understand and, and it. And the part of the problem is that all Etonians are men, so de facto you're excluding half the population. Question. Yeah. How do you get from, uh, as an individual, from internal values towards external impact on the constituency that you actually want to lead or, or aspire to lead? That's a very good question. I think most leaders sit um, seven or eight levers of organisation away from where the real work happens. Whether you're delivering care in a hospital or whether you're um, uh, developing new financial products in a marketplace, where the rubber hits the road is so far away from you, you sometimes wonder what your impact is. And people trivialise this in terms of, oh, well, you need to get out there, have communications programmes, walk the walk, talk the talk, pick any cliche you like. Whereas really, unless you have an organisation that has a value and a soul and thinks for itself and knows what's important, you, all the time you're having to fight the bureaucracy. And to me, if you can't get a, a socially important agenda 
which recognises multiple stakeholder groups, you know, the employees, the supplier base, the shareholders, the environment, everybody, and, and, and tries to generate long-term win-win solutions which the hundreds of thousands of people in the organisation buy into, think it's important, see it as a differentiator and a motivator, you can never have, substitute that for a set of control systems using a command and control culture. So it really is important to put the culture in place. Okay, before we take on the questions, I've noticed online that there seems to be support for the idea that Alex Ferguson wasn't a good footballer. <laughs> um, um, and can I just say, personally, as a QPR support, I'm not sure he's a great manager. <laughs> that, that is a joke. A bit more contention. Alex, if you're watching, that was a joke. Um, right, let's, let's continue round. We have individuals who lead organisations. We seem to be talking about engagement style here, but fundamentally, leaders are individuals, and aren't we really talking about how well those individuals are engaging and bringing people with them? And you know, Winston Churchill was brilliant during our war situation. He wasn't so good subsequently in rebuilding the um, from the depression years. So, isn't isn't it sometimes leaders got to flex with the situation? Perhaps the you know the world moves so quickly that the situation might move beyond their leadership style strengths? Um, I suppose that it is about individuals and, it, and things do change. And in fact, interestingly enough, um, with my uh, data on, on uh, universities, I actually found that there is a, a pendulum effect with leaders. So what organisations tend to do is they tend to, um, particularly the boards, hiring panels, tend to have whims and they, they, they change their choice about a leader, not necessarily based on the performance of the organisation. So I actually found a pendulum between hiring a good scholar and then hiring someone who is more of a manager and stuff. So in a sense, what you're saying, you know, that, that, that happens. But I guess, again, I would have to argue for going back. It is about individuals, it is about relationships, but we have to be able to find some tangible stuff in there that we can use, that, that organisations can use when it comes to hiring. Otherwise, I think we just fall back on this obsession with the individual personality and with platitudes that actually I don't think really help us in the long run. I think we, we do need to have to look beyond just that, the, the individual and the organisation and try and find some, some good patterns to help people to guide them. Otherwise, we get into the p political whims, you get into the whims of, of management fads, which I think is also another issue. I'm not sure whether that entirely answers your question. Okay. Right at the very back in the very corner. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious that most of the conversation seems to be about leadership as a singularity. Um, and certainly all the leadership teams that I've seen that are successful, from personal observation, seem there's often two or three people who, who lead. Um, I can understand the value of having an iconic person at the front of the organisation and therefore the person who's been the sports person or whatever does drive high performance. But I'd probably suggest that those people also have a couple of key advisors who may not be the icon but are probably doing a lot of the decision making and support. And I guess it's just all the books I've read and all the literature just seems to focus on this, this cult of individualism and on, on a singular leader. And I think that's quite damaging because I think it, it implies that one good person makes a good organisation. And there seems to be a gap between that leadership conversation and a conversation talking about the whole of the organisation and t working in teams and organisational culture. Have you seen any, is there any good quality research and good quality thinking or, or positioning around the, a small cohort, two or three people who lead an organisation? And isn't that a better thing to be talking about? I just respond very quickly because th there's a theory called upper echelons theory and it talks about top management teams and um, of course leadership is, is about um, top teams, it's about how that's dispersed in an organisation but the truth is and as far as I'm concerned the reason I focus on the leader is that very often you find that it's the leader that chooses the top team so if I can find a pattern in the leader it's more likely to be that the leader chooses the top team. Secondly it's the leader ultimately who has the power but also is the one who who goes. The top team may be brilliant and are very, very important, but that's why I focus on the leader. Okay. Just to answer that question, I mean, I, I, I do think that we're seeing the end of the rock star CEO. 
Um, and, uh, and I think that's a good thing, unless the rock star CEO is a true visionary who can, who can drive change. Second, to your question, that's why I argue about the co-creation of leadership. And, and I believe that the organization tends to be wiser than the leader, and that the really brave leader is the leader that questions his or her own authority. And just on a couple of other comments, I do think the masculinity of, of, of leadership is a problem. Um, and it, it creates this sort of rock star status and we, we still, that's the sort of dirty little secret of, not so little, of, of leadership. And then finally, to Greg's point, I would say um, that uh, great leaders need great instinct and they need to be around people who really prick their hubris. Unfortunately, a lot of those leaders pick people with the same instinct who have the same hubris. Um, and again, so the great, the, the challenge of leadership is to be prepared to challenge your own authority. Okay, great. Look, we've also got um, Jonathan Perks, who's uh, an expert in leadership, who's a visiting professor here, who's not on the panel, but I know he's been dying to get in. Is there anything you'd like to <laughs> kind of add to some of the things that we've said Thank so far? Um, I suppose my, my, my first thing is I've really thoroughly enjoyed all the different perspectives, but I'm particularly interested, maybe Joe, you might want to begin, on the question of female leaders, because having been 20 years in the Army, worked in PwC, IBM, and now coaching leaders across the world, there's a, there's a stalling in, in, the, in the need for more female leaders with IQ, with EQ, with moral quotient, and with spiritual quotient, soul, as was described earlier. So what can we do to bump start it? Because if Lehman Brothers was called Lehman Sisters, maybe we would have had a crisis. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's my question to the panel. Oh, yeah. no, I, well, I wish I had an hour to answer that. But, um, I suppose I shall just pick up on a couple of things. Um, the reason I got involved with the political arena was around diversity, because the Conservative Party wanted to increase the number of women and minorities as, as, as candidates. Um, but they had a constitution at that time, which meant that they couldn't interfere with local association selections. So the only point at which they could effectively gatekeep and try to increase the numbers was at the approvals process. Um, and you know, it's like a, a sort of good organisational psychology. So if you if you make if you put in robust selection promotion systems, then there's absolutely no reason that why women should do worse or better or whatever. Um, and actually, we, we captured the data and all the data that I've had subsequently looking at performance, um, looking at it and comparing under controlled conditions the performance of men and women. I've shown there's absolutely no difference in terms of how men and women perform political leadership. So in one sense, it was about creating some of the evidence base to bust the myths, because there are an awful lot of myths out there still about how women aren't good leaders or have got a different political or leadership style or somehow not effective. So I don't think we can underestimate the fact that that is there. The, the real issue for me was that when I went through the validation of the, of the approvals process and, and we looked at predictors of electoral performance, which in actual fact was critical thinking skills, but if you look at gender on that, only 20% of the pool of candidates coming through at approvals level were women. So even if you have fair and robust systems, you're never going to get more than 20% of MPs with, uh, with the best will. So, I mean, my feeling is that having gone from being anti-positive discrimination, because there's an awful lot of issues around that, the backlash, the Blair's babes, etc., and we see it in business too, that um, I'm a lot more supportive of the need to have positive discrimination around gender and other minorities as well. So. I'll pass it on there because I think we could go on for a long time on that particular issue, yes. Any other panellists want to quickly comment on that? Okay. Um, we've actually got a question online. Uh, what does the panel think about the Occupy movement as a model for leadership? That's one of the questions that's coming. Now, you've written about this, <laughs> Robert. Yeah. So you've written about Occupy. I've written about it, and I've, I've, I've participated in a number of debates with, with members of the Occupy movement. Um, I think the problem, I, I think the Occupy movement had a brilliant idea, and then their lack of leadership showed that that idea was not going to take root. So it was a paradox. Mm. Um, and, and that's why I talk about business leaders needing to address the 99%, because I think that the Occupy movement serves as a very important moment in, in, the, in the sort of history of corporate culture. And Castells writes about networks of outrage and hope. 
And obviously the, the Occupy movement was the network of outrage and what they didn't do was actually translate that into meaningful territory to be a network of hope. And when I made my opening comments earlier, I talked about co-created citizen-centric leadership being horizontal but not anarchic. So I think there's something in there that says that Occupy was right in, in understanding that it doesn't have to be this sort of old pyramid of authority, command, control, and that we had to respect the networks of organisations and of, of, of politics, but it does need to have defining leaders who can coalesce the, the, what the networks are saying and bring them into those moments of hope. Brilliant. Thank you. Should we open it back up? Um, question there, the one over there, just here. If you have them, get, get your microphone before you ask. It's a quick question for each of the panelists, if I may, please. One of the things which leaders have got to do is bring in change into the organization or whatever they're trying to lead. And the most challenging thing, in my view, is getting engagement from the workforce or whoever they're trying to lead. Are there any tricks in your experience which will ease the engagement of the workforce you're trying to lead? Um, I'll start with a cliche and then move beyond it. In, in, in my experience of change, you have to establish the burning platform, i.e. there has to be a really, really good reason to jump off where you are. That's the cliche, right? And um, if I can take that beyond that and into the real world, um, really people these days are carrying their burning platform around with them. I stood up at a private equity business which had a thousand employees the other week and it was a sea of faces. And I said, how many of you think the state's going to give you enough money to retire on? And they looked at each other, what's he on about? I said, how many of you think free health cover is going to last the next 40 years? How many of you think you're going to get onto the housing ladder? You know, the intergenerational compact is dead. We might be able to recreate it and resurrect it in some way, but it is dead because the, uh, the baby boomers have spent all the money and they're hanging on to what they haven't spent. And the next generation don't have a lot of economic growth to, to look forward to. And if that is not a burning platform for change, I don't know what is. On that happy note, is there anyone <laughs> else? <laughs> to, uh, come up the panel? <laughs> Some, um, there's some very interesting uh, technology platforms now that, that, that do you know, increased employee engagement. I spent yesterday with the Hotspots movement, um, which is started by Professor Linda Gratton, um, and looks at how you can create a swarm of intelligence using employees to better inform the organisation. Um, and I think that is a far more robust model of engagement, partly because actually, to, to your data point, it speaks to a much wider <coughs> group, so it's not narrowly focused on, on an individual, and partly because it goes right to the heart of an organization. One of the things that always worried me, uh, counseling CEOs, was that their answer used to be, let's have a town hall, as though a town hall was some sort of big listening exercise. A town hall was just another form of having a command and control operation by which everyone tacitly agreed. So I think you have to create the, the, you have to create the forum and the honesty where um, the employees can go to leadership with big challenges and real issues. And if you look at, um, if you look at HCL Technologies as a, as, a, as a good case study, they do some great work in business planning with the employees, which actually comes up with better ideas, better new product development, and, and a more engaged workforce. Okay, great. Right, question. That the lady that's looking around to see if she's... That's, yeah. Um, you started the uh, conversation about far field and near field uh, leadership and um, looking at the way we are dealing with teams which are located all around the world and the fact that we are using digital media nowadays to even uh, talk and communicate with our teams. What are the criteria of a far field and a near field leader? Yep. Yep. No, 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 I'm... I'm just chairing you. Well, I, I can say I'm not, I'm not sure that... Um, I think that leaders have to do both. I think they have to have the skills to do both. And it, it's simply a matter of understanding, um, developing the skills to deal with both of those. Um, and I suppose 
I've, I've taught manage, uh, leadership and change the first time for the Masters in Management students here, and I think one of the things that's really struck me more than anything else is that how international students are now and how, how leadership, how work is so international. Um, and I suppose one of the challenges, I think, um, is that we need to build that type of understanding and those types of skills right the way through business education now. Um, I mean, we do, we know lots about you know, how technology can impact on decision making, interpersonal perception, things like that. But I think at the same time, it's recognizing that the world of work has changed so much that that is the reality of what most people need. Um, I hope that answers your question, but uh, would anyone else? Mm. Yeah. Okay, good. Question there. Um, Greg, you started off by saying, as a leader, it's really important that you know what you stand for and who you are. Uh, and then, Robert, you followed on talking about the importance of co-creation and the common shared values. How do you get the two to meet? What, going beyond defining values, which you don't want to be doing too often, and going beyond the obvious, you know, leading by example. Thanks. I, th I think one of the most underrated leadership characteristics is intellectual humility. I remember uh, when I was the first um, chief executive of a public company, uh, one of the, uh, I think it was the chair of the audit committee, turned to me and said, what are we going to do about this? And I said, mm, I'll get if I know. And the chairman said to me afterwards, I've never heard a CEO say that before. <laughs> and if you can't say I don't know, or I'll go away and find out, or I'll consult with the team and we'll work on the issue together and come back to you, and you think you know it all, no one's ever going to contribute to getting anything done. So you, you've got to be at peace with yourself. If you spend your whole life proving yourself that you're the macho top dog of, you know, the alpha male of any team. And I agree with the point earlier on, totally male leadership teams have too high a propensity for risk. That's oversimplifying it greatly. But largely, uh, I have worked for Val Gooding, I was on the board of Bupa, chief executive running a 60,000 uh, person organization she was a brilliant inclusive leader with a lot of humility but she'd take the tough decisions but she'd listen to everybody she'd bring out the quiet people and say come on you've got some value out here what do you really think and i think really if the leader can't set the tone of inclusive debate admit when they're wrong be seen to change their mind when they have a better argument you can never get full value out of a team i i'd, I'd agree absolutely with with greg um and uh, I think it's not just intellectual humility, it's humility full stop uh, is, is the characteristic and the most important characteristic of, of any leader. Uh, from a business point of view, nothing used to annoy me more than going to values days with leadership teams where a bunch of usually men would sit at the head of an organisation of thousands of people and decide remotely what the values of that organisation were. I know it's passion, it's integrity. They just make these words up. And before you know it, they're on the walls of the washroom, so that when you're peeing, you have to know that that's what you believe in, passion and integrity. So, so corporations, are, uh, uh, they're, 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 they're sort of false creations. They're, they're not real. People are real. People have values. People have ethics. People have virtue. So it's only by listening to the organisation that you can build the values from within. And if you combine that with the, the humble leader, then you get, hopefully, the answer to your question. Okay, good. Just before we take any more from the audience, I've got one online that kind of links to this that's asking what are the top three top characteristics of a global leader? This is from Dubai. We obviously had things like uh, humility, passion, um, and maybe if each panellist would just identify one rather than three each. Can I just start off by saying that I, I think authenticity is a very important characteristic as well. I used to work with a, a very famous professor, a guy called Ian Manger, many years ago, who used to say to me, Cliff, authenticity is everything. And if you can't fake that, you have nothing, he used to say. <laughs> um, right, but let's, so if, if we maybe start with that end with Joe, if you just want to tell us what one characteristic you think of a global leader that's important. Uh, resilience. I think all leaders need a really high degree of resilience. The ability to tolerate whatever is thrown at them. And I actually don't think they'll get to be a leader unless they've got that resilience. Okay, great, thank you. Well, I've had humility. Can I, ha can I have virtue? You can. You, vis you visit better quality washrooms than me, by the yeah. way. So <laughs> I'd a, a virtue up there. I'd just like to say, following Alec Ferguson, scoring goals. <laughs> His elbows, goals. I think self awareness, because you've got to know when it's time to go. <laughs> good, good. 
Right, let's have some more questions. We'll have the one there, just here. Um, yes, I hang on, there's the good microphone. Really if you wait, just the microphone. Right. Really easy question for you. Uh, who has been your favourite leader and why, and what was inspirational about them? Really easy one. <laughs> Can I go last? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go first, Greg? I can see you. See, I can see you're dying to. Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky. I mean, I was mulling over the, the many good leaders I've been exposed to. I think uh, there was a chap called Sir Brian Smith who was ch chairman of Cable and Wireless a long time before I became CEO, uh, and he he was chairman of ICI and he was chairman of um, BAA and things like that. And um, what I liked about him, he was as hard as nails but he wasn't always right. And he would take his time. If a team had worked really hard, I remember I was running a mobile business at the time. We had 54 cellular networks around the world. And I'd killed myself to win this, uh, I'd killed half the team to try and win this license in Taiwan, and we lost. And uh, we were all sitting there licking our wounds. Uh, we'd come second out of five. And uh, he took his time to come out the head office all the way to see us and say, come on, pick yourselves up. You did all the right things. You were a bit unlucky. Next time. Now, it's really easy for the leader to pick out the winners and reinforce the good behaviour, but take the time to find the team that hadn't quite got there, worked hard, done all the right stuff. Uh, that really stuck in my mind because it wasn't a one-off. It was consistent in providing not just a management framework, but the emotional support for the people who needed it and deserved it, and I think that's really important leadership characteristic. Amanda. Part of me thinks I'm not going to answer this question because I'm not into going to this towards the obsession yeah. with individuals. But if I'm forced into it, I guess Tony Giddens, who I work with at London School of Economics, I like Tony because he was very um, he was very open and very honest. And LSE has a tendency to to um, get stuck at its bottom sometimes. And Tony was very down to earth, and I think he was very good for the place actually. Okay, great. Um, Oh, Aristotle obviously said that the philosophers should rule and lead, which is an interesting thing to say at, at CAS. Um, uh, I would uh, I'd like to say Alex Ferguson, um, even though, and that's not on a, that's, that's part of his United fan, obviously, but um, actually I think he's interesting for a number of, of reader, uh, reasons. Uh, it's in, he's almost like counterintuitive, because he, he, he does represent the command and control style of leadership, which, which sort of theory rejects. But the reason that I would nominate uh, Sir Alex is partly his ability to, to constant and his desire, the, just the, the hunger to win the whole time, but also the way he protects his team. The way that even when you know that one of those players has played utterly pathetically on the pitch, he will protect them in the post-match interview. And that to me is a sign of, of great leadership and also great humility. Actually, mine, mine links to that, uh, and it's slightly different. It's, it's, I suppose my favourite leader goes back to probably my first job after university, which was in a secure unit with um, adolescent defenders. These boys that I, were there because they'd either a risk to themselves or a risk to other people, and the leader in that, in that um, centre was Barry, Barry Blaren. And I, he was fantastic because it was the most difficult environment to work in, the most difficult environment for the boys to be in. Um, but he was there, and he, he kept the rules, but he was there, and he physically hugged the boys when they needed a hug, or he'd, he'd hug you, know, you if you'd had enough about being called everything under the sun. And I suppose it just it comes back to, yeah, you need your leader to be there for you. And I think if your leader is there for you, you'll do anything. You, know, you can cope with all the slings and arrows, so that's mine. <laughs> Chairperson's privilege, just before we go. I always ask when I teach leadership as part of uh, the MBA program, the behaviour course that I teach, when we have that session I say to the class, think of, think of a leader that you think is great and identify one of the characteristics you think makes it great. And it's quite interesting the range of answers you get. Um, the strangest one I've ever had as an answer was Adolf Hitler. And I said to the person, okay, great, and why? And the person obviously hadn't thought about the reason, and they just, because um, um, he had a strong sense of ownership. That's what they went for as a characteristic, which I thought was quite an unusual characteristic of leadership. Okay, we've got a question just there. Uh, 
Hello, hi. Um, for a question for Amanda and Joe, you both mentioned data sets and the study of data sets for psychology reasons. And we all know some leaders um, have a tendency to, um, well, to exhibit some personality traits that can be construed as, um, if not psychotic directly, at least neurotic, right, in, in certain things. I'm talking about Steve Jobs and others. Um, and I was just wondering whether any study of data sets have actually demonstrated that there are certain personality traits that are more prevalent in, uh, in leaders, like extroversion or neuroticism or anything like that? Um, yes, yeah, psychologists do like individual differences in personality. I mean, I, I, I'm very interested in the sort of relationships. I think it's more complicated than saying there are certain characteristics that are associated with success. But you can look at certain characteristics that might be associated with success in certain situations and how that works. Um, I mean, from my research, because um, I've been interested in trying to map, map individual differences in politicians, and they're notoriously difficult to get hold of, so it's taken me years to capture this. The data I've got shows that critical thinking skills predicted electoral outcome in the, in the 2005 general election. I've also got evidence that shows neuroticism or emotional stability is negatively associated with how other people um, rate the performance of politicians and conscientiousness is important. Now, in a way, those are the characteristics that generally come up in business settings as well. So there is some suggestion that certain characteristics are associated with success, but I wouldn't by any means say that those are the only things that are important. <laughs> yeah, my, um, my look at characteristics isn't about psychological characteristics, it's more about their the characteristics, their history, how much knowledge they've got in a particular topic, etc. But one thing that does, um, one thing that I have to be aware of is if you're looking at doctors to run hospitals, if you're if you're looking at experts um, in general, one of the the weaknesses that sometimes they do exhibit is hubris. So sometimes, you know, we can all think of the somewhat overconfident consultant who might be, you know, social skills might not be great. So in that sense, it does come into psychological. If you are going to have experts, actually, they do really have to be aware of, of being open to criticism and not being overly arrogant, etc. Okay. All right. I'm just making sure I'm not missing out on this side of the audience. The gentleman just there. We, uh, we mentioned Occupy Wall Street earlier, and in my opinion, they had both uh, sort of a leadership issue, but also a, an ideas issue. And what I think the ideas issue was is that a lot of the ideas were maybe somewhat uninformed or impractical to actually uh, implement. So just wanted the panel's opinion on how as a leader you engage with a wide group of people, but maybe don't get <coughs> rubbish opinions or uninformed opinions, things like that. Who would like to answer that one? I'm, I'm happy to go. I, mean, I, th I think one of the leader's roles is to filter the wisdom of the crowd from the madness of the crowd. Um, but to the point about humility, maybe the mad crowd is right. <laughs> okay. Well, can we have one more question? Uh, from, we've got a question from China here. Um, is, is Chinese leadership different? And I, I, if we broaden out, are there culturally bounded issues around leadership? Is authenticity more important in some cultures? Is directive leadership, etc., moral issues? Um, I was at, I was at um, one of these global economic events talking to some relatively senior Chinese politicians. I say relatively senior; they've got so many senior politicians. Uh, and I was having a kind of drink with them at one of the after events, and they were saying this current crisis just shows that Western democracy can't take tough decisions and solve tough problems. You need strong leadership, you need centralised leadership, you need to get your brightest and the best. They need to decide what to do and they need to get on with it. And we will come through this crisis better than you. Now, you have to say on the basis of, you know, just the observable background economics, I find it hard to differentiate the effect of leadership from where you are in the growth cycle of an emerging economy versus a stable economy. So I can't leap to that conclusion. But one of the, one of the problems we find is that our leadership style politically on the great stage, and it's characterised by the Eurozone crisis and all the different political agendas the politicians have to cater to, because it's really easy to, you know, to come up with what's right for Germany, what's right for Portugal, what's right for Holland, but not for all of them. So we do have a crisis of leadership at the top level. And I'm not quite convinced yet that the autocratic model 
has long-term sustainability because in the end you can you can keep 1.5 million people billion people on track by telling the the 1.3 billion that are very poor that their children will be better off as long as you deliver but russia showed that the journey from poverty to uh, affluence is a rocky road and to navigate the downturns and the economic um, um, perils requires inclusive leadership and the reason I say that is it's very simple for each one calorie that appears on your plate it takes 12 calories to get it there that shows the level of energy and infrastructure necessary to move food to people who need to eat it when Russia went through an economic crisis back in the early 1990s in the transition from state planning to uh, a liberal market economy the reason they didn't starve was because the big cities had a balanced agriculture within a very small distance of the city so when their infrastructure broke down they could still get food to people we live in an extremely fragile economy and the bigger the population density the more fragile it is the easier it breaks down and the easier people starve and it's the big crises of the 21st century that will test that leadership model to destruction can i just make one comment about an area that i think we can really learn from china actually one thing that china is capable of doing is taking the long view they can think very, very long term about things. And I think one of the problems with, with um, our model, and particularly the Anglo-Saxon model, is that we are very short, short termists. And I think if we're going to get over any of these issues, in particularly climate change, we have to take the long view. And I think if we can learn anything from China, we can criticise the, the views that they've taken, but at least they can take a long view. I mean, I was, I was going to um, make a, a similar point. Um, I work for eight years on the Edelman Trust Barometer, which is published every year, and the one word we haven't talked about in the context of leadership is trust. And as you move further to the east, into the controlled economies of Singapore, the UAE, and China, trust obviously went, went up. And that was partly because they're able to take the long view and then have pesky little things like elections to get in the way of, uh, of that accountability. So again, there's a paradox in there somewhere. I think the big challenge for the Chinese uh, government is actually going to be the growth of social media. You know, Sino Weibo, the Chinese equivalent of Twitter, now has nearly 400 million users. So that notion of controlled leadership is, is slightly mythological or is increasingly mythological because as, the, as, as technology drives further forward, as social media grows, then the, the sort of the genie is somewhat else the bottle. Great, thank you. Questions? One over there. Can I just ask factor, how much of a factor does age, in other words, increasing age, have on improving, uh, uh, improving the ability of leadership? I don't want to go back to Sir Alec Ferguson again, but maybe we could take a contrast in the three leaders of the main political parties are all in their 40s and don't come across as being conviction leaders, if you can describe them as leaders at all. Thank you. Okay, I, I wonder if, it, I, I, just in the issues I wonder whether we mean experience rather than age I, I, my, my PhD was on age discrimination so I'm kind of quite sensitive around just the notion of age per se but uh, it might be experience okay so panel uh, well, I mean, the, there is a lot of evidence that um, cognitive ability declines with age but to pick up on your point uh, that, that experience and knowledge can compensate for that um, and I think it's one of the stories about one of the um, Russian presidents um, who um, wanted a heart, uh, a heart um, bypass, and he went for the oldest um, surgeon as opposed to the, the hot shot one out of the, the medical school. So it compensates, I think. Also, another quite a nice analogy, um, which is not exactly the same, but Nobel Prize winners in economics, the theorists and mathematicians tend to do their best work when they're when they're very young. But the empiricists, which I am very glad to hear, I have to say, do their best work when they're quite a bit older. And of course, that's because they, they can, we can ask better questions when we get older of the data, we have a better perspective on the world. And I, I, I think that's quite an interesting, neat little example that, that feeds into that. I think it also plays into the construction of the team. Uh, because um, if you take the standard governance model of public companies around the world, uh, well, certainly in Europe, uh, you tend to have 
a younger, full of energy ideas leader and an older, semi-retired sounding board who's got a bit more experience. And if you take that, you know, um, binary situation into a multipolar situation, you know, the best teams I've worked in or run or been a member of have had a balance of youth and enthusiasm and age and experience and gender and every other facet because the more uh, diverse the team is in its makeup and its capabilities, the more likely it is to be able to cope with what's thrown at it. Okay, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Anywhere? Just here. It's just, just there. <laughs> the lady's just there. Uh, do you think uh, John Terry is a good leader? <laughs> <laughs> John Terry? <laughs> testing, um, testing. We've got this on <laughs> this tape. We're picking this up. Yes and no. Yes good and answer. no. <laughs> yes, because of his actual footballing ability on the pitch, he puts him up there amongst you know the, uh, the ca captains of football team. But as a role model in many facets of his life, I wouldn't want him as a, a role model for people. It's very brave of you to answer that question, <laughs> chair of the Football League. Any other views? <laughs> <laughs> I'm an Arsenal supporter and I'm really passing on that one. Yeah. I think it's a dreadful leader. Um, because, he's, because the role model thing, I think, in that sense, transcends everything else. And especially given the cultural influence of football. So it's not as though it's isolated from the cultural mainstream. So for that reason alone, I would fail him as a leader. Okay. A question for Greg. How have you brought the board with you when you've been a leader in a difficult situation? Um, the, the simple answer to that is you can't. Because unless you've got the board on your side before the difficult situation arises, you're toast. Uh, so um, what I tried to do early on is to be authentic. Say what I know, say what I don't know. Listen, take advice, but also understand the difference between taking advice and upward delegation. I, it's your problem board, tell me what to do and I'll get on with it. So you have to build trust, accountability, authenticity, so they believe what you're saying. They know that when you say something, you believe it to be true. They know that if you don't know, you'll say so. They know that you've talked it through with your team. You've come up with different options. You've identified the criteria for choosing between options. Then you come up with a rational one, and you know the risks implied in the course of action you're recommending. And then if it all goes as unravels, as it does many times, because not everything goes well in the business world, as we all know, they understand that they were part of getting to that process. They still hold you accountable, but it fends off the sense of outrageous anger and indignation for a bit longer, which buys you a bit of time to try and fix the problem. Just, okay. just, sorry, just on that, but one, one of my experiences, which always puzzles me, is CEOs who then take out, to use their wonderful adversarial language, all those on the board that they think might be a threat to them. And that seems to me to be entirely the wrong strategy that the board should be there to hold the leader to account and to, to prick the hubris. Um, but increasingly, or often we see in business, this terribly adversarial language where we'll decapitate those who threaten us, or we'll, we'll take them out, or we'll lay waste them, very macho language. So I, I think there, is a, there needs to be a rethinking about that relationship between board and leader. OK, last question over there. Thanks. I'd like to go back to Amanda's first point about the um, demise, if you like, of the generalist leader towards the more specialist leader. Many of us in the room are recent MBA grads, and we are, by our nature, I think, generalists, having taken that kind of qualification. What do we need to do as leaders of the future to kind of arm ourselves to be in the position, um, people like Greg, in the future, where we can talk about our experiences of either being generalists or specialists? I think... I think because you're doing an MBA doesn't necessarily make you a generalist. I mean, I, I think a lot of the people who, funnily enough, in, in the data set on my hospitals, um, quite a lot of those had done MBAs, and these were doctors. So actually, I, think, I don't think it means that because you're, you know, you're getting extra training in management, which of course I think is very important, that's why I'm in a business school, 
that you're not necessarily a specialist. I still think that even if you've got an MBA, you really, really do have to um, understand the, the business that you're in. An example, an extreme example of, of, of what I might argue, but is a very extreme example, is Andy Hornby, who was the CEO of HBOS when it went down. And he, um, he had very little banking experience. He was fast-tracked. He was top of his class in, uh, in, at Harvard in his MBA. And I remember an academic at LSE who, who knew him very well saying, I said Andy Hornby in a way exemplifies the sort of all I need to be, all I need to have is an MBA from a very good place and then I can rule the world kind of culture. I mean, it is an extreme example. Anyway, this guy who's, who's a professor in risk management, actually, I won't mention his name, said to me, oh, Andy Hornby, he's, he's, I know him, he's a very good friend of mine. He's very clever, you know. And I said, okay, well, then you won't mind if he operates on your children. And the point I was trying to make is that having the MBA and being an expert manager and stuff is, is very, very important, but alone it's not enough. And certainly he, and, and he fell on his sword because of that in a way. But I, I think having an MBA is fantastic, but I still think you want to know the industry, you want to know the business you're in is what I would suggest. Uh, a, a slightly um, contrary point, because I agree with the thesis, but I would say that I'm a great believer in the first World War fighter pilot analogy, which is they were all expert fighter pilots, but 95% of them still got killed because it was a tough environment. And there was a lot of people who had been in banking for 50 years who crashed and burned as well. So it is more difficult to succeed unless you are an expert yeah. in the industry. Yeah. And I can say that because I've moved between industries. I spent most of my career in tech industries, but I've also been in financial services, and I've also been in property, and I've also been in health. And you, it, when you're out of your depth, frantically trying to look like you know what you're doing, you really need your team. You really need your humility and you really need your ability to listen. And if you think you're the smartest guy in the room, that is a big setback. Okay, we're at that point in time where I think uh, we ought to call it a day. There's lunch outside, but I'd like you to join me in thanking what I think in a fantastic debate. <laughs>